So as Dolores has said, I'm a recent um, Ad Astra hire at the School of um, Public Health, Physiotherapy and Sports Science, but I'm no stranger to UCD. I did my undergrad here in uh, biochemistry and genetics, um, and I stayed on to do a PhD with Professor Helen Roach, um, and then stayed for a, a bit of a postdoc afterwards. So there I looked at um, obesity and inflammation and how the two interact um, to cause metabolic disease. Uh, so in 2012, I relocated. I headed to New Zealand and took up a position at the Liggins Institute at the University of Auckland. Um, so uh, my research here focused on um, kind of early life nutritional stressors and how they impact the development of um, cardiometabolic disease in later life in the offspring. <clears throat> Um, so I guess one of the, the themes that we were asked to talk about was the challenges. And I guess in the developmental origins field, obesity is one of the really big challenges. And I guess, you know, I don't need to tell anyone here that obesity is a really huge problem worldwide. And Ireland certainly isn't exempt. Um, we're seeing increasing rates of obesity in our adult population, but also in our, our young population, which is quite worrying. Um, so my research focuses mainly on diet and maternal diets, but the range of <coughs> which can have significant impacts on the on the offspring and these include uh, preconception diets in both the mother and the father and um, poor diet during pregnancy and right through to adolescence in, in, the, in the child and um, so I specifically look at kind of components of the western diet so high sugar high fats and, and high salt and things like that um, and what we know is they cause a range of developmental adaptations and these can either be in the in the uh, placenta. So we see changes in blood flow, nutrient transport and endocrine profiles and um, in the fetus itself. So there's significant kind of alterations in the epigenetic profile of these fetuses, um, which can cause a range of metabolic effects um, and can affect growth trajectories and things like that. Um, but also there's changes in organogenesis where there's a reduction in the kind of set down of, of cells and certain organs such as the kidney and the and the pancreas, which can have huge implications for blood pressure and glucose tolerance later in life. Um, again, we also see changes in endocrine profile and, and things like that. But it's not just at this early developmental stage. With these effects persist throughout the life course and can predispose to metabolic disease. And they can even influence the postnatal environment, where we see that um, offspring from parents who had these adverse diets um, can have alterations in their taste preferences. So they're more likely to, to enjoy sweet or, or fatty kind of foods. Um, and they're also more likely to be inactive um, as adults. This all comes together to create a, a condition of chronic disease. Um, and it's mainly obesity and cardiometabolic disease that we see, but there's actually a range of different, um, different conditions that have been associated with this developmental programming effect. Um, it can include uh, neurological diseases and even some sorts of cancers. Um, <clears throat> so with developmental programming, it was once thought that the the kind of developmental adaptations were relatively static and couldn't really be changed. Um, but what we now know is there's critical windows of intervention. Um, and this is some of the work that I've done in, in New Zealand has, has looked at these intervention strategies. Um, but what's key is that you have to intervene early in life. So either in the in utero timeframe or um, through to adolescence, because if you intervene after that, you're much less likely to have a meaningful effect. Um, so I guess in the DOHAD field, one of the benefits is it's really multidisciplinary. I've really learned a lot of, of techniques in, in my time in New Zealand. So most of my work sits in the preclinical space and we've developed models of maternal diet during pregnancy um, and looked at, at offspring effects kind of in, in their later life. So there's a range of benefits for looking at preclinical models. One of the, the main ones is that they have quite short lifespans and it label, enables us to look at a real longitudinal effect right through from pre-pregnancy to kind of middle age, I guess, in, in these animals. And we've optimized um, a range of techniques that has enabled us to look at the physiological implications of these early life diets. And then gone on to look at biomolecular, uh, biochemical and molecular techniques to kind of tease out some of the mechanisms that underlie this developmental programming and kind of give us some clues as to how we can intervene. Um, and I guess cell models have been really useful, both in terms of validating some of the work that we see in our animal models, um, but also as a tool for translation to the human situation. And um, we're using uh, things like PBMCs from the mothers or placental cells can really kind of um, give us information on these early life kind of situations. <clears throat> Um, so I guess my research takes three kind of main themes. Um, the first is to identify molecular targets which influence early life risk factors for obesity. 
And this feeds directly into the, the second uh, theme, which is intervention strategies. If we know what the molecular targets are, we can develop intervention strategies around this and with the aim of reversing the negative impacts of developmental programming. Um, and the final one is to expand the range of exposures which may influence developmental programming. We know that you know, there's a lot of dietary and environmental compounds that we actually don't really know how they, in, how they impact pregnancy and, and later development of the offspring. Um, so what I thought I'd do just for the rest of the talk is just kind of go through some of the work that I've actually done recently in New Zealand and kind of give a snapshot of the, kind of, of the type of research that I do. Uh, so the first study that I'll go through is um, work that we've done on artificial sweeteners during pregnancy. Um, and the specific sweetener that we've looked at is a sulfame K. And this is uh, 200 times the sweetness of sugar. And it's found in a range of, of diet and light, so like uh, beverages and, and food products. And it's often found um, in conjunction with the sulfame. And while a sulfame has been relatively well characterized, or um, uh, aspartame has been relatively well characterized, a sulfame K hasn't really been to the same extent. And particularly during pregnancy, we don't really know what the, the outcomes are. Um, but over the last couple of years, there have been a range of really nice cohort studies which have shown associations between um, uh, artificial sweeteners um, and conditions such as preterm birth, uh, increased offspring BMI at, by the age of seven, and gestational weight gain. Um, so these studies have been really informative, but one of the flaws is that they don't really break down into the specific uh, sweeteners. They just use um, sweetener intake as their, as their measure. So we wanted to kind of distill down some of these effects and see what happens in terms of a sulfame K in our rodent models. So we set our, up our study with the three groups. So a negative control, which was just water in a normal diet, um, our sulfame K group or artificial sweetener group, um, where we fed it. Uh, we fed the artificial sweetener in the water and just had a, a standard diet and a fructose positive control where we fed our fructose in the water again with a normal diet. Um, and I think one of the flaws of some of these kinds of studies is they use super physiological doses of these compounds to elicit effects and we didn't want to go down that path. We wanted to mimic the human situation as closely as possible to get a meaningful effect that would be relatively translatable to a human situation. So our, our um, concentrations of both fructose and the artificial sweetener were modeled on the equivalent of say a human uh, drinking a 500 ml bottle of soda a day. And um, so we also looked at kind of longer term effects in the offspring. Um, and this is work that's just been completed. Um, and we have a student in New Zealand who's, who's currently kind of, kind of working up this. So I'll just talk about the pregnancy uh, stuff today. So what we saw was, um, so despite what they see in cohort studies with the uh, gestational weight gain, we didn't see any of that in our model. There was no difference between groups and weight trajectories um, over the course of pregnancy. But what we did see was a change in glucose tolerance. So we did an oral glucose tolerance test where we gave a, a glucose load to our mice and measured glucose blood concentrations up to two hours. What we saw was that both our fructose group, which is not surprising, um, and our artificial uh, sweetener group, which was relatively surprising, um, were significantly glucose intolerant during pregnancy. Um, and what we also saw was the artificial sweetener group had a significant reduction in the length of pregnancy, pregnancy um, which mimics um, some of the, the results that are coming out from our, our human models. Um, we looked at fetal weight and saw that there was a significant reduction in fetal weight in our artificial sweetener group. And this is likely due to the fact that they were born that, that bit earlier, I guess. And um, we also looked at fetal glucose concentrations. Um, and this is an interesting one because we saw that there was a significant redu reduction both with the artificial sweetener and the fructose. Um, and it's important because we see with women who have gestational diabetes, their neonates often have complications such as hypoglycemia. So it's kind of mimicking the human situation in that regard, which is quite nice. And finally, with this study, I just wanted to touch on the fact that uh, we looked at these, the mothers who were fed the artificial sweeteners long term. So one of the flaws of these kind of studies is often you look at the mother up to pregnancy and then you follow up on the offspring, which is great and really important. But we know from women that have GDM, they're more likely to go on to have um, type 2 diabetes and metabolic complications later in life and um, this isn't really kind of um, touched on I guess in the in the kind of rodent models that, that are out there. So we looked at our, our mothers we followed them up for 10 weeks postpartum um, and just to note that these animals um, did not receive the diets past uh, birth so for those 10 weeks they were just on a normal chow diet and water 
And even though they hadn't received the diets for 10 weeks, the sweetener and the fructose groups were still significantly glucose intolerant compared to the controls. Um, so again, this is a nice kind of um, translatable aspect to this research that we're kind of seeing what we see with gestational diabetes in these animals. And um, so again, the student in New Zealand is currently working up the tissues from these animals. So it'll be really interesting to see what's causing these effects. And um, so for the next study, I'm just going to look at some of the molecular targets which influence um, early life risk factors. Um, a lot of the work that we've done in terms of nutritional stress during pregnancy has shown that there's an increase in pro-inflammatory um, mediators, um, both in the mother and the offspring. And we do see this in, in, in pregnancy complications in humans as well. So I wanted to look at the effects of the IL-1 signaling pathway. And this is some, something that follows on from work that we've done in UCD in male mice. So in our male mice, we had fed um, our, our, our high fat diets and saw that the mice who had the IL-1 receptor 1 knockout genotype um, were protected from um, metabolic complications of obesity. So we wanted to see if that translated to a pregnancy uh, situation. So we set up our model with our C57 black 6 mice who are control mice and our IL-1 receptor 1 knockouts um, and fed them either a control or high fat diet. Um, for a habituation period prior to pregnancy and then throughout pregnancy. Um, and again, looked at their glucose tolerance towards the end of pregnancy. <clears throat> um, so what we saw was that the animals who had the IL-1 receptor 1 knockout were, signif um, were significantly lighter um, and they gained less weight over pregnancy. Um, and this is likely due to the fact that they ate less, um, they consumed less calories. Um, but surprisingly, we didn't see the same type of result that we saw in our male mice where they were protected from glucose intolerance um, on a high fat diet. We saw a huge diet effect where the high fat diet had um, resulted in glucose intolerance in our animals, but the genotype didn't really affect, affect matters at all. Um, and then when we looked at these animals in the postpartum period, actually the, the animals who received a high fat diet in conjunction with the IL-1 receptor 1 knockout um, were significantly worse in terms of their glucose tolerance um, compared to the high fat diet and the, the controls. And this is, um, this is associated with an increase in, in insulin concentrations as well. So these animals have, have quite significant metabolic uh, complications. Um, so in our pregnant animals, we wanted to look at the adipose tissue and um, we know this is one of the major organs which mediates glucose intolerance in general and we wanted to kind of have a look there to see if we could kind of see what the underlying mechanisms were. So unsurprisingly, in our high fat animals, um, we saw significant hypertrophy or enlargement of the adipose cells. Um, and again, there was no real difference between the, the control and the IL-1 receptor 1 knockout mice. But what was quite surprising, despite the fact that they didn't have any changes in their glucose tolerance compared to the control, we saw significant hypertrophy in our IL-1 receptor 1 knockout controls. Um, and when we looked at the molecular level, we looked at PPAR gamma, which is a major regulator of adipogenesis. <clears throat> Excuse me. We saw this was reduced across the board in our treatment um, groups. <clears throat> and is likely why we're seeing this, um, these effects in terms of adipocyte size. We also looked at PREP1, which is a marker of pre adipocytes. <clears throat> this was increased again in our IL-1 receptor 1 knockouts in high fat groups. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and what's happening here is likely that there's a disruption in adipogenic um, processes, um, which was, reduces the capacity of the adipose tissue itself, resulting in metabolic complications. <clears throat> <Sorry>. <clears throat> I was also quite keen to look at fertility outcomes in these animals. So we <clears throat> kind of observationally just noticed that we got less pups and less pregnancies in our, in our IL-1 groups. And so we kind of set it up so we could look at it within our experimental paradigm. What we saw was the high fat diet and, <clears throat> and even more so with an IL-1 receptor 1 um, animal on a high fat diet, we saw a significant reduction in the percentage of pregnancy. So these animals were certainly subfertile. We also looked at the days to first litter from mating. So when we introduced the male right through to a viable litter, and this time frame was significantly increased in our IL-1 receptor 1 um, high fat groups. And um, so certainly these animals have significant subfertility. We looked at the ovary just to see if this could account for some of these effects. And indeed, we saw a significant increase in some of the markers related to follicular genesis, which indicates that these pathways are disrupted and is likely what's causing our, our subfertile phenotype. When we went on to look at the offspring of these animals, we looked at the female offspring and measured puberty onset and saw that 
um, there was a significant reduction in the timing of um, puberty in these animals, both with high fat diet and with our IO-1 receptor 1 knockout group. Um, <clears throat> this has significant implications for later onset of obesity and metabolic dysfunction. Um, so I guess the take home messages from the study is always do male and female um, animals when you're doing biomedical research because they have quite polar opposite phenotypes in some situations um, as we've demonstrated here with our IL-1 um, models. Um, and it's likely that the, you know, in males we see inflammation as a real critical point in determining whether or not an animal is going to go on and have metabolic dysfunction, but this doesn't seem to be the case in females. Um, and what we see in females is actually adipogenic processes are really important for the kind of onset of metabolic disruption, um, certainly during pregnancy and the postpartum period. Um, so I think this is interesting work and we'll, we'll follow up with the offspring to see what kind of results we're, we're getting. Um, so in terms of the intervention strategies we've done, so CLA I guess is the most comprehensive one. So CLA is conjugated linoleic acid and it's found in ruminant animals and their beef and, and dairy products. Um, and it's in cattle that are fed grass rather than grain. Um, which I guess has a lot of relevance for Irish, the Irish mode of, of farming. Uh, there's more than 28 different isoforms, um, but the most common are the C9 T11 CLA, which is known to be anti-inflammatory, and the T10 C12 CLA, which is anti-obesity. Um, so these are things that came up in our animal studies, like the, the inflammatory aspect and the obesity aspect. So we wanted to see if we could counteract these negative effects of a high fat diet in pregnancy um, um, with CLA. Um, and at this point, to the point that we did the study, there was no, no research at all looking at the role of CLA in pregnancy and programming. <clears throat> so when we looked at the mothers, um, mothers that were fed a high fat diet had a significant increase in HOMA IR, which is an index of insulin resistance and metabolic dysfunction. And they also had increases in pro-inflammatory profiles. So I won beta and TNF alpha are significant potent inflammatory molecules, and these were upregulated with high fat diet. But when we supplemented with our CLA, um, we saw a reduction um, in this, um, which is kind of akin to what, what, what was seen in the in models that um, in non-pregnant state. <clears throat> and when we went to look at our offspring, we measured their growth trajectory throughout their life course, and we saw that male offspring from mothers who had had a high fat diet were significantly heavier throughout their life course. And when we did a DEXA scan um, towards the end of the study, we saw that this was due to an increase in fat mass. Um, so when the mothers of the uh, animals who had had a high fat diet um, were supplemented with CLA, um, these effects were completely prevented. And again, when we looked at glucose tolerance, we saw that animals whose mothers had had a high fat diet had significantly worse glucose tolerance. Um, but when the mothers had been supplemented with CLA, their male offspring were protected from these effects. Um, and interesting, uh, interesting, we actually didn't see any difference across the board with females. <clears throat> they didn't have any change in their weight trajectory or uh, glucose tolerance. And this again kind of underscores the importance of doing both male and females when you're doing this kind of research. Um, but I guess the females weren't exempt from kind of any negative effects. When we looked at their estrus cycle, we found that Animals who had had a mother that was exposed to a high fat diet had irregularities in their estrus cycle. But when mothers had been supplemented with CLA, this was prevented in their female offspring. Uh, we know that estrus cyclicity is often associated with lipid profiles. So we looked at the lipid profiles in these animals and saw um, female offspring who had had a mother that had had a high fat diet had significantly increased triglycerides, free fatty acids, cholesterol and LDL cholesterol. Um, and when their mother had been supplemented with CLA, this was prevented. So there was some quite nice effects here showing, um, showing CLA being quite beneficial in the females as well, just in a different regard. Um, and we looked at males, these parameters in males, um, well, the lipid profile is not the estrus. Um, we saw that this was, this was not the case. There was no difference across the board. <clears throat> Um, so very lastly, I'd just like to touch on some recent work that we've done uh, looking at breast milk analysis. Um, and specifically sex specific effects in breast milk. Um, we've done this in conjunction with a group in the University of Turku in Finland um, on their STEPS cohort study. Um, so we've looked at a range of different compounds or um, bio biomolecules or bioactives in the breast milk. So they range from glucocorticoids or stress hormones. Um, we've looked at um, adipokines and we've also looked at growth factors. 
So what we see is when we, um, when we separate our, our group out um, into mothers who had had GDM and control mothers, um, we see that leptin concentrations were significantly increased in GDM mothers. Um, and this was irrespective, of, or this was when this was controlled for BMI. Um, and it was much more potent in the lap, in the um, in the boy babies and the and the girl than the girl babies. But with a dip a dipinectin, what we see is mothers who had a dipinectin had or who had GDM had significantly reduced a dipinectin in their breast milk um, if their baby was male. Uh, but if their baby was female, we saw a significant increase in the dipinectin profile. So there's some really interesting work here looking at um, at this um, sexually dimorphic effects in breast milk, and it's something that I'm quite keen to follow up on. Um, here in Ireland. <clears throat> so just finally, I'd like to go through some of the key challenges. Um, so translation to a human setting is also, is always like a really huge issue with uh, preclinical models. So our aim is always to try and translate our findings to a human situation. Um, and I guess the cell models represent a really useful tool for doing this. Um, funding is always an issue, particularly in basic research, but I've been quite lucky and um, I've recently got word that I've um, been successful in an ISSF mid-career stimulus grant, and that's going to enable me to do some research looking at paternal diets, specifically high-fat diets and artificial sweeteners um, in the male diet, and, and how that, that impacts fertility and uh, paternal programming in the offspring. Um, so I guess the final one, I've, I've moved kind of halfway across the world, so establishing a network here is really critical at this time. So. If anyone has any interest in any of the work that I do or was spoken about here today, I'm always happy to, to have a chat with people and, and establish collaborations and that kind of thing. So thank you very much for listening to me. <laughs> um, yeah, that's me. <clears throat>